All right. OK, audio seems to work. Um, let's slowly get started here. Since we only have 15 minutes, um, uh, thanks for taking your lunch time to, to uh, come here, by the way. Um, so this is my opportunity uh, to kind of warm up to my Spring Framework 5 to 2 talk right afterwards. Uh, this is a 15 years of Spring retrospective. 15 years of Spring in 15 minutes with um, 15 slides. Um, the 15 years are actually quite creatively counted. Um, I, um, I started from my own involvement in early 2003, um, counting up until 2018. We're really already in the 16th or 17th uh, year of uh, spring, uh, depending on where you start counting. So um, let's start with uh, my own involvement. I uh, read that book back in 2002. December 2002, uh, I got myself this like almost 700-page book, uh, read it over Christmas break. Um, Rod, Rod Johnson um, wrote this book, spent, spent time writing this book for the better part of a year, the better part of the year 2002, and not only wrote the text, he also wrote a uh, kind of a supporting framework code uh, that was illustrated in the book, explained in the book, and in many ways, um, uh, the design was uh, laid out in the book. It followed design discussions, design ideas um, in, in the book. That download was a download on the publisher's website uh, in a com.interface21 package. Didn't really have a name, didn't really have much of a, of a goal of a future, an immediate uh, future. It was just a download for a book. So I, I really liked what I read in that book and uh, got in touch with Rod through the author feedback forum on the publisher's website and suggested, like, what about taking this, these ideas, this, this, the code, that, the quite extensive code that came with the book, this kind of prototype, this early form of a framework, and uh, to turn it into a proper open source project. Not like a download that comes with a book that some people are going to look at and move on, but rather a, a an open source framework that it keeps evolving, that keeps building a community where we keep taking those design ideas forward. And that's exactly what we did. Um, towards early 2003, we uh, created a SourceWatch project. We had to choose a name. SourceWatch was the GitHub of the times, right? And the SourceWatch project needs a name, so uh, uh, the first phase we had to go through is selecting a name. And uh, we came up with Spring Framework after a couple of suggestions, but we really liked the implications of Spring the season. Um, and uh, uh, Spring Framework, of course, as a unique name on SourceForge, Spring Framework was the name that we went with, created the repository. We uploaded the code that came with the book as a starting point and had a very intense phase, first phase of development in that first half of 2003 leading up to the first release, Spring Framework 0.9, in June 2003. So uh, um, on our way there, of course, before, before we would even agree that we, we, we follow that path, Rod came, came up to me and said, like, you know what, this is a really great idea, this turning it into an open source project, but I, I need equal commitment. He couldn't do it on his own. So in that phase, I was already strongly involved as... Um, the technical lead for the core framework project as kind of a shared lead initially. As of the Spring Framework 0.9 release in June 2003, uh, I was officially the release manager, kind of the, uh, uh, the core framework project lead in the sense of me uh, line, uh, laying out the roadmap, managing the releases uh, down to every maintenance release. And uh, I keep serving as the project lead and as the release manager ever since. So every single Spring Framework release in the past 15 or 16 years uh, was literally signed off um, by myself, even all the maintenance and backport releases. Uh, as you may imagine, I'm a bit of a control freak in that respect, but I really believe in sound um, project management and release management. So uh, back to the framework itself. The uh, um, origins, of course, the original incarnations of Spring predate JDK 5, predate annotations. So the internal architecture was a programmatic architecture um, with an XML B definition reader on top, X an XML configuration format as the reference model on top, and some early support 
for other metadata formats following very soon. Uh, at Transactional, our first um, annotation-driven service annotation came in in Spring Framework 1.2, um, shortly after JDK 5 got released. So we, we quite uh, ambitiously evolved that framework, but not on its own. Um, there was already an open source ecosystem in the, uh, in the Java space, not only with uh, uh, the ones here, but of course those are names that are still very present today. Um, Tomcat was already a thing at the time. It turned into a real self-sustained project that you would be willing to use as your primary Java-based web server. There was, of course, Jetty with a history just as long. Uh, there was Hibernate, and Spring's Hibernate integration was quite famous at the time. Um, the uh, um, Spring Hibernate combination still is very popular today, of course. Um, there are also projects that faded out. The above-mentioned Struts era, Apache Struts had its time. Uh, of course, it had a few years where it was the primary choice of web framework. Um, it largely faded out. Uh, in, in the meantime, of course, but there was al also a prominent stack at the time that was Strut, Spring, and Hibernate running on Tomcat as a very popular st stack combination of those, those days. We kept writing books. There was a follow-up book to the uh, <coughs> initial J2E design development one called J2E without EGB that I was a co-author of. This is already the third book in, uh, in our history. Uh, the first dedicated Spring Framework book, uh, dating back to 2005, a long time ago. And those are all original images, by the way, that you're seeing in this presentation, reflecting those times. So uh, in particular, this one is really reflecting um, the five of us writing this book uh, in younger incarnations of ourselves. Um, suffice to say that uh, um, this writing this book was really in conflict with uh, engineering work on the framework itself. And this was the last book project that, as far as I'm aware, any of us were involved in as primary authors. We only did uh, reviews and forwards afterwards um, with other people stepping up and writing uh, um, books about uh, uh, spring and spring-related topics. This was really the last book we did ourselves, and we focused on evolving the framework because there was really a small team, a company formed around it called Interface 21 at the time. A few people... Uh, really working on the open source projects, most people doing trainings, most people doing consulting and trying to turn this into a sustainable model. Um, Spring Framework 2, though, was a very collaborative effort with uh, lots of input from, from everyone in the team and also from, from uh, community contributions already. Uh, it was still very much XML-based, but with the namespace format, the configuration namespace, the AOP namespace, the TX namespace, uh, which also in terms of its model, um, suggested the add enable annotations that came later. Spring Framework 2.5 in 2007 um, started introducing annotation-driven dependency injection in Anger, so the add auto wide model, qualifiers, component scanning. Um, Spring MVC with contro add controls and add request mappings really date back to Spring Framework 2.5 released in late 2007. So there was some really, really aggressive um, evolution of the framework. Um, the framework's core architecture, the core structure, the core architecture largely remained the same. We strongly believe in evolution, not in, in, in revolution with uh, backwards compatibility breakages. Um, and Spring Framework 2.0, 2.5 really demonstrated this quite well with uh, XML next to the annotation-based configuration format within the same framework architecture. We uh, turned into Spring Source in the meantime. So there were the former company Interface 21, which was largely a services company, um, morphed into Spring Source. Um, Spring Source uh, significantly larger, uh, more people working there, and our understanding was more of a product company at the time, where we really tried to do not only the Spring open source portfolio, but also several products around it. IDE tooling um, and two server products called TC server and DM server. DM server, an OSGI based um, runtime that was contributed to, to the Eclipse project later on and has an afterlife as Eclipse Virgo now. But that just as a side note. At the time, it was still a spring source product. And of course, as a product, as a US-based product company, 
you have to have corporate marketing coming up with uh, uh, large-scale marketing campaigns. And this was one of them that I have fond, uh, strange memories of. Um, this was one of the, uh, the, the US-led campaigns, Weapons for the War on Java Complexity. If I wouldn't have told you that it came out of the US, it, I guess it's obvious, right? Um, so there, there, are, there are spring bell ships here and TC server tanks, TC server being our Tomcat distribution, DM server, the OSGI-based product, DM server fighter planes, all attacking um, kind of this land of complexitania. Blah. Um, from a European perspective, once we saw this uh, campaign for the first time, we tried to do everything we can uh, to not uh, use it in, the, in, in Europe. Um, but, I mean, that's what you get. Um, uh, marketing is an important part overall. No, you can't get everything right. I, I count this as a, uh, a mistake in retrospect, but uh, uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, we went about it. We are mostly a developer marketing company, but at that time we uh, started having corporate marketing. Back to the uh, uh, open source ecosystem. Um, this was really an ecosystem in the meantime. Uh, we uh, not only had the core Spring Framework product, uh, project, there were already several um, popular projects around us. Spring Integration, Spring Batch, um, then more, more specifically purposed ones, Spring Roo, a sort of early version of the ideas that later turned into boot, uh, some ideas at least. There's Grails as kind of a Groovy-based web framework on top of uh, core Spring and specific uh, uh, frameworks like Spring Security, Spring Webflow, very popular at the time, uh, Spring Data emerging at those times. Most of those, or all of the here mentioned ones, were already present 10 years ago in 2009. And this is, by the way, also an original graphic that we used at that time. So 2009, of course, um, saw the uh, launch of Spring Framework 3.0 uh, in, in late 2009. This is already a couple of months post-acquisition. Spring Source got acquired by VMware in late 2009. Uh, and formally, uh, Spring Framework 3.0 is the first Spring Framework release under, uh, with Spring Source being a division at VMware. But it was in the making for a long, long time. Uh, we worked on Spring Framework 3.0 for um, more than two years. Uh, it, it came with a JDK 5 baseline, complete revision of the code base, all APIs. Um, Java E6 support uh, at the time, which was quite timely, just uh, Java E6 went out um, just a little bit before. Um, Framework-wise, it introduced the notion of configuration classes. Previously, an, a prototype, kind of a, uh, an, a non-supported extension that we called Java config before, became part of the core framework offering at that time. Of course, that's the foundation for what is now known as Spring Boot. Spring Boot is really configuration classes on steroids. The core facilities were introduced 10 years ago in Spring Framework 3.0. And uh, Spring MVC saw a major overhaul. It already had the annotation-based model, as I mentioned before, since 2.5. But it now came with a complete revision, uh, REST support, path variable abstraction, uh, validation integration, many other things that uh, we take for granted right now, uh, date back to that time. So just to give you a few visual impressions, this is basically the reference model in 2009. Um, component classes like service classes annotated with uh, certain stereotypes, certain characteristics, uh, dependency injection at the constructor level here through an annotation, and transactional service declarations for methods that uh, require a transactional boundary. Pretty much the same model that we still use today in a refined form, of course. So uh, the next major release uh, at our, well, uh, also a few years into it at VMware, uh, corporation-wise, uh, was Spring Framework 4.0. And Spring Framework 4.0 was uh, a, um, um, a quite ambitious effort on our end. Uh, with full JDK 8 support, uh, several months before JDK 8 went GA, we really tried to be ahead of um, uh, the times because we saw so much potential in uh, what, what became JDK 8. And of course, JDK 8 is now the baseline for everything we're doing, even now in 2019. 
So the uh, uh, Spring Framework 4.0 was also the foundation for, sp for the Spring Boot 1 generation. So Spring Boot, not the focus of this particular presentation, but uh, Spring Boot emerged shortly after Spring Framework 4.0 and, of course, uh, developed a whole, a whole community of its own almost. Uh, it's now the preferred entry point into the Spring ecosystem for, for many people. Uh, it builds on core facilities in Spring Framework 4.0, the configuration model, uh, many refinements like configuration conditions that came in to the core framework in Spring Framework 4. The, uh, typical, the typical controller, this is Spring Framework 4.3 uh, in the meantime, um, started looking like this. It's a refinement of the, the old uh, Ed controller model. Uh, we had now these pre-composed annotations, more specifically purpose mapping annotations. We had core support. We had, uh, of course, path variable extraction, as already mentioned. So it's, it's largely the same kind of model with the same visual impression and the same development experience, uh, but with refined features all the way through. That is the state of the art as we see it here in uh, Spring Framework 4.3, and it still is the state of the art in Spring Framework 5 if you choose to use the Spring MVC Slack. So, Spring Framework 5, of course, taking us uh, almost to the present, uh, launched about uh, two years ago, uh, again with a huge baseline revision. So, it's like, it, um, like JDK 5 in Spring Framework 3, which was a really major revision, giving us uh, uh, generics, uh, uh, var arcs. Um, and JDK 8 really gave us lambdas, it gave us method references, it, it, it gave us the Java util function package and Java util str collection streams. So uh, um, lots of facilities that are really great tools for framework authors and in particular for framework API designers. So we took the opportunity with Spring Framework 5 um, to again revisit the entire code base um, upgrade the entire framework to the JDK 8 API level, also the framework surface area, if you're interacting with the framework through APIs, through callbacks, um, through implementing interfaces that now have default methods in Java 8, you'll have a really fully Java 8 oriented experience. Uh, ironically, that turned out to be not that big a deal for most people because uh, we've been told that the Java 8 experience, the development experience using Java 8 with Spring Framework 4.3 was already so, so totally fine in practice uh, that this full baseline upgrade that we did in Spring Framework 5 didn't make as much difference. We had so much optional support for Java 8, automatically activated optional support for Java 8 before um, that probably we were more excited about this particular baseline upgrade in Spring Framework 5 uh, than anyone else. Uh, but still, there's a lot of a little subtle extra value that even came in Spring Framework 5 here, uh, beyond the optional Java 8 support that was there before. Uh, of course, there's also Servlet 4 and generally the Java E8 API level. Uh, more importantly, there's uh, strong design themes that we, we chose to apply to the Spring Framework 5 generation. Um, functional API design, as in Java 8's functional API design, as in Java 8 collection streams, as in Java util function, um, but also as in Kotlin functions. We started embracing Kotlin in Spring Framework 5, which of course keeps being a, a, a huge uh, theme going forward. Um, at the same time, we started tackling reactive architectures. So uh, two really very, very major design themes starting uh, to emerge here in Spring Framework 5. And uh, just to give you a reference, this is the foundation for the Spring Boot 2 generation um, that we're on right now. So um, the, a, an important decision uh, in evolving the framework here was how do we go about reactive architectures? Do we try to kind of unify the web framework so that it is at the same time uh, a, a, a server-based framework and can be used reactively? We didn't really pursue that path. Um, it, we learned pretty quickly on our way to Spring Framework 5 that the only way to do this properly is to have a dedicated reactive web stack. So in Spring Framework 5, you actually get two web stacks. You get Spring MVC, Servlet MVC, running on the Servlet stack as usual, without any breakages, the same APIs, the same SPIs, the same model, the same behavioral characteristics. And in parallel to that, you get what we call Spring Web Flux, which is our reactive web offering. Um, in, in many ways, we could have done a different product. We could have called it differently, not spring, something else, whatever, well, at least we could have shipped it as a separate 
project, but we chose to include it in Spring Framework proper because we saw so much demand for other projects building on it. Spring Security integrating with it, Spring Data integrating with it. For this uh, to become a core part of our offering going forward, we chose to include it in Spring Framework proper. That's where it still lives today. And uh, we are, to, to wrap this up, we are now on our path to Spring Framework 5.2. Spring Framework 5.2 is about to be released. Um, uh, we are aiming for an RC1 in July. Um, GA is currently aiming for early September. Um, Spring Framework 5.2 is largely a continuation of the themes that we laid out, that we started laying out for Spring Framework 5.0. So it continues our J uh, Java 8 API efforts. It's uh, surprising how much impact Java 8 has on, on library design, on, on framework API design. It keeps having an impact even now. There are further refinements that we're making, uh, not just in terms of the obvious stuff, um, uh, all, uh, not, not just the language features, it's mostly API integration. Uh, where, for example, Java to time integration, there's always potential for improving there. So the, we're not at the end of that road yet. A strong focus is on our annotation processing logic. Uh, Spring Framework 5.2 uh, is significantly more efficient, uh, quite radically more efficient in its annotation processing compared to previous Spring Framework versions. Uh, so it is significantly faster uh, on startup with a large number of annotated components. Um, and an, a number of side benefits, integration, optional integration with indexes, etc. So it's really a total overhaul, a re-implementation of annotation processing, largely transparent to you. If you're building applications, there's nothing to do. Uh, you get those benefits just through an upgrade to Spring Framework 5.2, continuing that tradition of ours. Uh, and there's a couple of, uh, of important topics that kind of complete the picture for us. Spring Framework 5.0 was the start of a generation. Um, we knew that it was sort of incomplete. There were, was no reactive transaction abstraction in 5.0. There is now in 5.2. And uh, we ship reactive transaction managers for MongoDB and for R2DBC for our reactive relational database uh, effort run, run by Pivotal. We ship those in Spring Data, integrating with the core framework facilities in 5.2. Um, similarly minded, we didn't really have a fully reactive messaging architecture before in our Spring messaging module. So in Spring Framework 5.2, there, there is now a reactive flavor of Spring messaging, a little bit similar to Spring WebFlux in style and in mind, um, primarily driven by our socket integration. So it is a general reactive messaging abstraction, but its strongest driver is our socket. So we're really embracing a new um, communication model which is an externally run. We are strongly involved in RSocket, but it's, uh, it's, it's externally run. Of course, it's a collaboration uh, with many other key players out there. Uh, and uh, talking about collaborations, uh, we have a strong ongoing relationship with JetBrains. We always believed in, um, all, all across those five, 15 years, we believed in close collaboration with other major stakeholders in this industry, other open source projects, but also IDE and tooling vendors, server vendors. Uh, and JetBrains with Kotlin is a primary um, example today. In Spring Framework 5.2, we upgrade our Kotlin efforts quite a bit. There's now early support for Kotlin coroutines. Um, so to use the Kotlin coroutine um, model adapted to our underlying reactive architectures. Uh, this is quite straightforward, not least of it all because of the co active collaboration that we have. Um, we chose to include those forward-looking efforts in Spring Framework 5.2 already, even if they are kind of just about ready uh, towards, towards September for general availability. Um, we hope that you can have an interesting experience kind of getting the feeling for how, how uh, you could work with Kotlin coroutines in Spring quite early on, even against uh, the current milestone and the upcoming RC1 already. By all means, please uh, follow our evolution. <laughs> uh, try Spring Framework 5 to 2. And uh, I hope uh, uh, you enjoyed a, this, this quick tour through a little bit of history and a little bit of uh, our current work. Thanks for your attention.